In this video, I'm gonna be going over some of the most common Java interview questions. These are gonna be questions geared more towards a junior role, which I feel like is appropriate for this channel because a lot of you guys are learning Java. But if you are more of a seasoned developer, I think this would be good review. And we are gonna do some more intermediate questions towards the end. Now, these aren't gonna be coding specific questions. They're more like concepts, but I'm gonna show some coding examples to convey those concepts. These are also gonna be core Java questions. So nothing related to Spring, nothing related to Swing, no like uh, database management or anything like that. By the way, a lot of these concepts and more are covered with my Java course that I just launched. It has over five hours of content and you can preview a couple of the videos to see if it's something you wanna purchase. I put a lot of work into the course and I think it's really good if I don't say so myself. So I'll leave a link down below in case you wanna check it out. So I wrote down about 20 questions here that I thought were good questions, but also give you a good breadth of the language. So let's just start with the first one and tackle these one by one. So what is method overloading versus method overriding? So these are two similar names, but fairly different concepts. So if we have a method overloading, that just means that within the same class, we can have methods that have the same name, but they have to have a different, either a different type of parameters or a different number of parameters. So let's create a new class and let's just call it example. So in here, let's create two methods and let's call them print stuff, print stuff. And let's give it a return type of void. And then let's pass in an integer X and let's copy that and paste it. So as we see here, we immediately get an error saying print stuff int is already defined in example. So what happens is when we create an object, and we do e.printStuff, it doesn't know which one to call, right? Because they have the same name and they have the same number, of, uh, same number of parameters and the same type of parameter. So one thing we could do here is we could either change this to a string and the error goes away, or we just add another parameter and it could be of any type really, and the error goes away that way. Now, one thing you can't do is change the return type. So if I just change this to an int, and then here I try to like return a zero, it's still gonna give us this same error of print stuff clashes with print stuff int. Both methods have the same erasure. I don't know what that word means, but basically it says that print stuff is already defined in the example. Now, this is different than method overriding, which has to do with inheritance, where a child class can implement its own version of a method that was inherited from its parent. So if we create another class, so let's just go ahead and delete this method here. Let's create a new class. Let's call it example child and it extends example. And then in here we have the print stuff method. Let's actually print something out. I am the example class. So if we create a, the child class here, let's do example child, example child. And we try to call example child dot print stuff. And if we run that, we say, it says I am the example class. But if we want example child to have its own version of that, then we would just simply copy this, paste this. And now that example child has its own version of print stuff, it's overriding the parents print stuff. So now if we run that, we see that it says, I am the example child class. All right, next question is, what are the differences between heap and stack memory? So stack memory is the amount of memory allocated for each individual program. It's a fixed memory space. So if we want to draw this out, so say this right here is our memory. Well, what we have is we have an, a dedicated part of the memory for this program dedicated for our stack. So this is where things like local variables, parameters, things like that are gonna live. So say you have something like a method call or a recursive call, when it starts a new call, it needs to save the 
local variables of the current method call. So it'll put it on the stack. It'll put things like your local variables, uh, your parameters. It's going to also store the return address. So once the new method ends, it knows where to resume the program. But like I said, the stack portion is fixed. So if so, you've probably heard the term of a stack overflow, and that's if you have too many method calls or recursive calls and too many items get put on the stack, well, eventually you're going to run out of space, and then you have what's called a stack overflow. However, the heap, in contrast, grows dynamically as your program runs. Grows and shrinks, I should say. So whenever your program is running and you need to allocate space, you're going to use something like the keyword new, right? Like a new object or yeah, basically a new object. And what that does here is it says, okay, is there any space on our heap? Yes, there is. It allocates that space. And then when this object goes out of scope, it frees up that memory. But that doesn't mean that it's not safe to running out of memory. If you allocate too much space, your heap is also going to run out of memory and your program is going to crash. So basically the takeaway is that stack is a dedicated fixed space for your program and the heap is dynamic memory that gets basically grows and shrinks as your program runs. All right, next up we have is explain the expected output of the following code segment. So let's copy this and paste it into our program. All right, let's paste that and we're getting errors here because it doesn't like the quotation mark from notepad. So let's fix that and fix that. And I think we should be good. Okay, so let's think about this before we run it. So it's two print statements. The first one here, it's going to go left to right. It's going to take the 100, which is an integer, and it's going to add it to 100. So it's going to have 200 here, which is an integer. And then you have the integer 200. Now these are literals, right? They're not saved in variables. 200 plus a string. So what it's going to do, Java, now language, different languages are going to do this differently. In Java, since it has an integer plus a string, it's going to cast the integer also to a string. So it's just going to be 200, keep on coding. And then in here, like I said, it's going to be a string plus an integer. So it's going to cast the 100 to a string. So it's going to be keep on coding 100. So basically it's going to look like this. And then again, we have a string and an integer, and it's going to cast the integer to a string. And then it's going to have, basically just be like, keep on coding 100, 100. Let me undo that and run the program. And we see we get 200, keep on coding, and then keep on coding 100, 100. Next question, what are shallow copy and deep copy? So when you have an object, Let's create one of our example objects. And let's give it, uh, let's have a variable here and we'll call it X. And let's set example.x equal to 100. And it's complaining because we added, to, we added it to the child class. I want to add it in the example class. Okay, so now say we want to create a copy of this example, and I'm going to call it example one. Now, if you're a beginner, you can be like, well, I know with variables, I can just set, if I have y, and then I set x equal to y, well, now these are independent variables. If I change x, it's not going to change y. So you might be like, okay, I have this object here. Let me do example example two equals example one. And then let me set example two dot X equal to 200. And then let me print out example one dot X. And we say, wait a second, this says 200, but I set example one dot X equal to 100. And then I set example X example 2.x equal to 200, so why is it example 1.x equal to 100? Or why isn't it equal to 100? So basically with this line, you're just setting another pointer pointing to example 1. So whatever you do with example 2, it's going to affect the object that example 1 is pointing to. 
So with this line here, example one equals new example, we're creating a new example object and we're setting a variable or a pointer called example one to point to that. And right now it has the variable X and we set it to 100. And then in this line here, example two, basically all we're doing is we're just setting another pointer to point to this object. So then when we do example 2.x equals 200, we're updating this value here. And then when we call example 1.x, it's now 200 as we see here. So this is a shallow copy. If we want to create a deep copy, what we could do here is we could just simply, we'd have to create a new example. And basically that's all we'd have to do. So if we print out example one dot X, we, we now see that it has, it retains that original value of 100. All right, next question is, what is the garbage collector and how does it work? So the main object or the main objective of the garbage collector is to free up memory space that's not being used anymore. So this ensures that the memory resources um, are used efficiently. So in the example that I showed you with comparing the stack and the heap, we saw that the heap grows and shrinks. Well, basically when you use the new operator, that's the heap growing. And then once you're no longer using an object, that, that's when the garbage collector comes into play, cleans up or deallocates that memory and the heap shrinks. So how that would work is basically the garbage collector keeps track of any type of new object that gets created. And then basically it checks, now it's more complicated than this, but it just keeps a reference of, you know, how many variables are pointing to this object. So right now the count would be two, but then say, say this variable goes out of scope. So now it updates the counter to one. And then say this variable goes out of scope, it updates the counter to, z to zero. And then now that it sees that it's zero, it takes this data here and deallocates it back into the heap and saying, okay, this is memory that can be reused. But like we saw, this provides no guarantee that there's going to be sufficient memory for the program to continue to execute. Eventually, if you keep allocating data without deallocating it, you're going to eventually run out of memory. And kind of a side note of how the garbage collector works is as your program is executing, basically the garbage collector will suddenly pause execution of your program, do its cleanup, and then resume the program. But this is, in most cases, this happens so quick that you don't even notice it. And it doesn't really affect the execution of your program. All right, the next question is, what are the differences between constructor and a method of a class in Java? So a constructor here, if we go to our example class. So the constructor is always going to be the name of the class. It doesn't have a return type. And let's just print something out. I am the constructor. So let's go ahead and delete all of this. And let's call example one dot print stuff. So we see, I, let, me, uh, let me go here and actually make this print a new line. So we see I am the constructor, I am the example class. When you create a new object, it will, the constructor gets invoked implicitly. You don't actually call, I mean, technically you are calling it right here when you create the object, but basically this is implicitly calling this method here. Whereas with the print stuff, we explicitly call it. Now, a couple things, it's impossible for a subclass to inherit the, uh, the constructor. But a method, if it's public, the child will inherit it. Like I mentioned, there's also no return type with the example, but with this, you have to specify some kind of return type. If it doesn't return anything, you still have to put a return type of void. And also the constructor, the name has to match the name of the class. And last thing to mention is that example is a method. A constructor is a method, but a method isn't necessarily a constructor. All right, uh, what is the this keyword in Java? So in Java, whenever you're within a class and you want to call or invoke 
a method in the class or reference one of the variables, you can, use, you can do this using the this keyword. So what I could do here is I could just do, so I could just, I could call print stuff in here with a, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this parameter here because it's kind of throwing me off. So we can call print stuff, but we could also call this dot print stuff. And this does the exact same thing. Now, a more practical reason of why you'd want to do this is if you have like a variable here and it's called X and you want to set X equal to X. So the issue here is in this method, it's using the most local variable. So even though we have this X up here, it's going to basically set this X refers to this X and this X refers to this X. So it's just setting itself to the same value. It's never touching this variable here. So if we want to explicitly do this, we could do this dot X equal X. And as you can see, the color change, meaning that it's being used now. All right, let's just keep going. What is an abstract class? Uh, let's go ahead and minimize this. I'm going to create new classes here. So let's go ahead and delete all this. Let's create a new class and say we're making a game here and we have an enemy and we want to have an enemy have an attack method. So we'll have public, let's just do void for now and we'll call it attack. You know, I am an enemy attack. And then say we have another class here and we have, we want to have types of enemies. So for this, we could have something like a ghost and it extends the enemy class. So this extends enemy, but in practice, we never really want to create an enemy object, right? It is like, we only want types of enemies. So we do want to have this enemy class here just so we can uh, have classes extend it and override methods, but we never actually want anyone to create an enemy class because that wouldn't really make sense. Like an enemy isn't a, an actual thing. It's more of an act, it's an abstract concept. And then we'll have like ghosts or goblins or whatever types of enemies that we want. So in order to ensure that no one actually creates an enemy object, we just add the keyword abstract. And then now if we go back, we get an error saying enemy is abstract, cannot be instantiated. All right, explain the super keyword in Java. So super refers to super class. So whenever we're in a child class and we want to refer to something in its super class, we can use a super keyword. So let me delete this. Let me change this back to a regular class. So in the ghost class now, what we could do here is for some reason, say we wanted to, you know, we're overriding the attack method in enemy, but say for some reason, we still want to call this method explicitly. Well, we really have no way of calling attack, right? If we call attack, it's going to just refer to this method here. So what we could do here is we could call super dot attack. And then if we run this, we see that uh, we get an error on our previous class here. Let me delete the example classes that we made before. Here we go, delete that and delete that. Okay, let's run that. And, uh, and we see that we don't get anything because we haven't created the ghost class. So let's create a ghost object. Okay. Now it will, it still won't run because we need to invoke ghost.attack. And now if we run that, we see that I am an enemy, I am an enemy attack. This is from super. Again, let me add a new line here just so it's easier to read. We see it calls ghost.attack. It goes into here and it calls super.attack. Okay, super is enemy. Call that attack method. Then it prints out, I am an enemy attack. Then it goes to this line here, I am a ghost attack. So that's one use case of using super. It is mostly used though, I would say, when you're creating a constructor and you have variables that are passed in that are associated with the parent class's constructor, then you would call super and then pass in the appropriate parameters that way. But I think this initial example that we use here demonstrates is a good demonstration of what super does and why we need it.
All right, next question is, why are generics used in Java programming? A generic here is say something we have like, we have something like a list. We can pass in a type as if it was a parameter. So we can pass in something like an integer. We give our list a name, say new, let's say array list. Now we do need to import list. So just as if we were passing in a parameter to a method, we can pass in something like an integer, a string, or really any type. So this is more for the implementation of something like an array list. So you don't have to create an array list class for strings, and then you don't have to create another one for integers, and then another one for floats. Well, you can't do primitive types, but you know what I mean. You can just create one array list class. If we go to the, you can actually go to the definition, Java's definition of an array list. I think if I think it's period click no what is this control click yeah control click and we see if we go to the definition here we see that minimize that basically creates array list and it passes this in as a generic saying that we can pass in pretty much any type that we want here and another kind of more practical example is say we didn't have Say we just created a list here without any type. And then we wanted to add a string like hello. So now say we want to set, create a new variable of type string and we want to set it equal to list.get zero. Well, we're going to get an error here saying it doesn't really know that this is going to be returning a string, right? Since we didn't specify it here, it can be any type of object and Java being a strongly typed language doesn't like that. So what we could, I mean, we could get around this by explicitly casting this to a string and then it gets rid of that error, but like this is kind of messy, right? It's much easier if we just set it here. And then Java already knows that this is a string, so we don't need to cast it and we don't get any errors. How is the final keyword applied differently between variables, methods, and classes? All right, so we have this final keyword here. So if we go to our ghost class and we want to say we want to give our ghost a health. So we could do something like int health equals 20. But say we know that the health is never going to change. It's always going to be 20. So what we could do here is we can add final and let's go ahead and actually try and change it here so let's remove final and we'll set health equal to 10 and it's fine right but then if we add the final keyword it says cannot assign a value to final variable health so basically it creates a constant variable that can never be changed and in good practice is to always capitalize your final variables. So this is at the variable level. You can also have final methods, meaning that we can't override them. So we have this attack method. And if we say public final void attack in the ghost class, it's going to say attack cannot override attack in enemy. Overridden method is final. So this just ensures that a method does not get overridden in any of the children classes. Finally, we have final at the class level, meaning that we can never have any class extend or inherit or be a child or subclass, a lot of terms, right? Be a subclass of enemy. So now if we go to ghost, we see that cannot inherit from final enemy. All right, next question, what is protected? So the protected keyword allows us to access certain variables or methods within a package but not access them or not be able to access them outside of that package if we go to our code here say in our enemy class we have something like a, a name you know and we want it to be private so we have private name 
and let's give it, let's make it type string. So in here, if we go to enemy, if we, if we try to change name in the subclass, it's going to get an error saying name has private access and enemy. And also if we, let's go ahead and delete all this stuff here. If we create an enemy object, we also can't access name from main. Again, name has private access and enemy. But say for some reason, you know, we want our child to be able to change the name here, but we still don't want it to be changed in our main method. Well, what we could do here is we can put enemy and ghost in the same package. So we can create a new package can right click and say new package and I'm just going to call it Sam and we're going to put a ghost and enemy into the Sam package and now what we could do is we can go to enemy and we can change this to protected and now if we go to the ghost class we see that we don't get an error anymore it's a protected string name however in our main class since this isn't in the sam package we still get the error name has protected access in sam dot enemy sam is the package enemy is the class and one thing that intellij did for us was it added this package sam package keyword and sam package in here so just something to point out all right next question is what is the difference between equals and the double equal sign in java Basically, the double equal sign is a comparison operator, whereas equals or dot equals is a method. So say we have two strings here. We'll have S1 and it equals Sam in caps. And then we have string S2 equals Sam in lowercase. And then we'll say if S1 double equals S2, then we'll say strings have the same value. So if we run this, we know that these aren't going to be equal, right? Because these are capitals, these are lowercase. So nothing gets printed out. But then we could say, okay, what if we do S1 dot to lowercase? Then this is lowercase Sam, this is lowercase Sam. It should be equal, right? Well, nothing gets printed out. That's because the double equal sign is used for a reference comparison. It compares if it, it checks and sees if two entities are at the same address. Whereas the dot equals method is more for comparing the content inside of that memory address. Simply put, the double equal sign checks if both objects point to the same memory location, whereas dot equals evaluates the comparison. So if we do something like s1 dot to lowercase dot equals and then we pass in s2 into equals and run that we see now it says strings have the same value all right is java passed by reference or passed by value well short answer it's always going to be passed by value there's a little bit of a caveat here so say we have so say we have a method here called static void change. And then we have a variable here called 10, call change. So basically, so what this does here is it just sets a equal to, let's say 1000. So then we'll pass an X and then we'll print out the value of X. And we see that it prints out a 10 because when it passes in X here as, a, uh, as an argument into change, it creates a copy of X. So now that we're changing A, it has nothing to do with X. It just has the value of X, which is 10 here. We set A equals to 1000 and then it goes out of scope, but then it doesn't really affect X. So whenever you have a primitive type, this is something that you don't, you don't need to worry about at all. It always creates a copy. However, if we have something like an object or an array, which is an object, then things get a little bit uh, trickier. So let's say array, do one, two, three. 
And then in here, in change, we are now passing in an array, and then we'll set the array of value zero equal to 1,000. And then we pass in array, and then we'll print out array at value zero. And if we run that, we see that it does actually change the value of the array. And you're like, wait, wait a second, Sam. You said that Java is always passed by value, but it seems like this is passed by reference. Well, technically, you're still creating a copy. This int array right here, this is a variable. And when you pass it in here, it's creating a copy of this variable, but the value is still pointing to the memory address of this array. All right, next question is, what is a, sing what is a singleton class and how do you ensure a class is a singleton? So a singleton class is a class where only one instance of that class can ever exist. And this is typically done by one, ensuring that all the constructors are private, and then two, creating a method that returns a reference to the instance. So let me create a new class here and we'll call it singleton. So in the class itself, I'm going to create a private static singleton object in here. We'll just call it singleton equals new singleton. We create our private constructor. And then we'll have a method called get instance, which returns. Oops, it returns our singleton object in the class. So then in our main method, we would simply just say singleton, singleton one equals singleton dot get singleton, right? I think that's what we called it, right? Yeah, get singleton. And then now if we create another object here called singleton two, these actually refer to the same object. So if we want to, let's just, let's just, let's actually just print out the, let's print out the object itself, just to ensure that they're pointing to the same memory address. So if we print both of these out, let's again, print out a new line. I don't know why it keeps defaulting to the regular one, but we see that they're pointing to the exact same object. All right, next question is, what are composition and aggregation state the difference? And you know what? I'm going to change this up. I don't want to talk about aggregation. I'm just going to talk about composition. And the term composition makes it seem like it's kind of intimidating, but it's actually a fairly simple concept. It has to do with having an object inside of a class, an ob object of another class within a class. And it also has to do with the has a relationship. So if we have something like a person, a person has a job. So what we could do here is we could create a Java class called person, and then we can create another class called job. And then inside of our person, person has a job. And let's make it private. So within our job, let's just have something like a salary, and then in our constructor, let's set the salary equal to uh, 50,000. So then in our person class, we can have a constructor that just prints out job.salary. So now if we create a person object, And we run that, we see that we get an error. It says cannot read field salary because this dot job is null. And that's because we have to actually create an instance of job, right? We have to do this dot job equals new job. Then if we run that, we see that we get 50,000. 
So what's happening here is we're creating a person object. So it invokes the constructor of person. Then in here, it says this dot job equals new job. So then it goes to the constructor of job. It sets salary equal to 50,000. And then in the next line here, it prints out job dot salary, which as we saw is 50,000 and which is what gets printed out here. All right, what or explain static block. So the static block is something that gets executed at the time of class loading. So it gets executed before the main method runs. So if you want any type of logic that needs to be executed before the main method runs, then you would place this inside the static block. So basically what that looks like is you'd write the keyword static, you'd have an open and close parentheses. And for this example, let's just print something out that says I am the static block. And then in our main method, let's print, I am the main block. So if we run that, we see, I am the static block gets run first, even though it's not in our main method. And then I am the main block gets run. All right, why is the remove method faster in the linked list than in an array? And I think this should be array list. Well, that's due to the nature of a linked list and an array list. So if we have an array with a bunch of values, and say we want to delete a value at index zero, well, in order to, to delete this, we can't leave this blank now. So we have to shift every single value over, which can be very slow. But when you have a linked list, you just have a bunch of nodes that are pointing to each other and say we want to delete the second value here. All we need to do is simply just move this pointer to point to the next value. So we're only changing really one thing here. Whereas in an array list, we have to shift over potentially every object. How does the size of an array list grow dynamically and also state how it is Im implemented internally? So this is a really good question to kind of understand how an array list works under the hood. So when you have an array, right, you have a fixed value that you have to set when you create the array, right? You can either, um, you know, set it explicitly by adding the values, or you can have uh, brackets here, and then you state, you state how many values it has. But a lot of times you don't know, right? You don't know how big you want your array to be. So this is when an array list comes into play because it can grow and shrink as much as you need it to. But it's not like magic or anything happening under the hood. It's basically, it uses an array and then whenever it fills up that array, it just creates a new array that's bigger. So say, so under the hood, say you have an array with like five elements. Once it reaches five, basically just, I don't know the exact number. I'd have to look at the, how the array list is implemented, but I think it's either, it either doubles it or it adds 1.5 to it. So if it has, um, you know, 10 values in it, then it would create, once it reaches the maximum, then it would just create a new array with either 15 or 20 elements, copy the initial array. So it'd be something like array two with 20 values and then it'll copy the first 10 values into array two, and then it has 10 more open spaces. So that is how an array list grows dynamically and how it's implemented internally. All right, and finally we have, what is a comparator and comparable in Java? So these are both pretty similar in that they specify how to sort particular uh, collections of data. So normally you could have something like an array list, and it can be an array list of integers. Let's import list. Let's go ahead and delete this other stuff here. And then you can do something like collections dot sort and the list itself. Of course, we want to add some values. So let's just add 23, 
12 and 8. And then if we print this out, we see that it prints out 8, 12, and 23. So it sorted our list. I mean, this is pretty, I guess, self-explanatory what the sort would be, right? We just have a list of integers. Sorting integers is pretty straightforward. But what if we have a list of type person? And we have, you know, three person objects. Well, now it's not so clear how we want to sort person, right? Because it could have multiple fields. We don't really know what we want to sort on. So there are two ways to do this, right? We can add a comparator or a comparable. So let's start with a comparator. So a comparator would be, is an interface that we would implement in our person class. And since it's an interface, we have to implement this compare to method. Otherwise, if we don't want to mess with this class, we could use what's called a comparator. And a comparator is a class and we would basically pass in type person, we would give it a name, and we would set it to new comparator, and then we'd have to implement this compare class. And then in our collection.sort method, we would pass this in as an argument. Now, I'm not going to go too much into how you would actually implement the compare method or the compare to methods. Uh, there's a really good video that I watched from the channel Telusco or Telusco that I will leave a link to because basically this concept here would be in a video in itself. So I'm just giving you guys a high level overview of what comparable and comparators do. If you want to dive more in depth with it, I highly recommend you watch that video. All right, so that's 20 common questions that you might see in a Java interview. Again, these are more in the junior level, but there were some more that I would say are kind of more intermediate level questions. So hopefully you found it helpful. Let me know if you want to see more of this video. I can definitely I'm sure I can dig up more questions. And then again, if you do want to check out my course where I do cover topics like this, as well as basically anything from like a beginner level Java all the way up to being a proficient Java developer, I'll leave a link to that below if you want to check it out. Like the video, subscribe, and as always, keep on coding.